I guess we're going to get started. Um, so my name is Mike Wilson. This is Zoo Park. We're from Bluehost. Um, we're going to talk about our experience using OpenStack. We use it a little differently than, uh, well, than a lot of people think about the cloud. They think about elasticity. They think about all these concepts that are maybe in flight, that are still getting defined. Um, we use OpenStack in a traditional hosting environment, so we're going to talk about that and how it's worked for us. So I want to start out, how many of you guys here are running OpenStack? So we, have, we have a couple. Um, anybody doing like a, a large installation, a couple hundred nodes? I'm not sure how big ours is actually. I work for Canonical, but we post stuff on it, definitely. Okay. All right. Our, our, our installations, I think last I heard, we were about 200. 200? Okay. Well, all right. Get that. <laughs> About time you guys met. <laughs> so, so we were in Portland at the OpenStack Summit a few weeks ago. I kind of posed the same question. There were a lot more hands in the room, and we kind of went, you know, up the installation sizes, and we went up to a couple hundred, a thousand, that, going from a couple hundred to a thousand, about half the room, going above a thousand, there were probably four people with their hands raised. We got up to 10,000, it was us and Rackspace raising their hands. Um, we got up to uh, 15,000 and we were raising our hands. So <laughs> what we found out is we're, we're kind of nuts. We're one of the largest in the world that's known publicly. Um, so anyway, we want to talk about it. So this is what happened. Uh, about eight months ago, uh, Spencer, my boss, my boss right there. <laughs> he comes and talks to us and he says, hey, uh, so our parent company is, is making an acquisition and I, I can't really give you any of the details, but we need to be prepared for it. So he gave me some basic guidelines. He says, right now, where we're running about 2,000 servers, uh, we need to be running at 10 times that. We need to be around 20,000 nodes. Obviously, this is gonna change the way that we do things. We need uh, a management system to take care of all this stuff. We need to be able to go out, plug hardware into the data center, and it just needs to come up. We can't mess with it. It needs to come up all the time. Um, also, it's in our future to probably be in multiple data centers in multiple geographic locations. So we needed to consider that in the design. And uh, we had about two months to come up with that. <laughs> Whew. Stressed me out a little bit. So we kind of came up with some high level requirements. We wanted centralized management. We didn't want this to be all over the place. Uh, wanted to be horizontally scalable. That was like the ideal design, so we could just keep adding more hardware, more services, and it would take care of our load. Of course, we needed abstractions for physical and logical deployments of devices and resources. We really wanted to be involved in an open stack uh, or an open source project. Spoiler: <laughs> with lots of uh, momentum, lots of support. Um, so, really, what we were looking for are a lot of typical cloud features that people go for. You know, really ease of provisioning, ease of imaging, migration, etc. Um, so, with an eye looking forward to a future cloud offering, we really we said, well, OpenStack is the answer. It's the platform out there that everybody seems to be going to. It's structured very nicely. It's going to scale. We, we put our bets there. We said OpenStack is going to rule the cloud uh, uh, world here in the future. So, again, just talking about our scale. Um, Today, I think we're just a little over 17,000 physical servers. Uh, most days, we're adding hundreds of nodes. Uh, we're kind of, again, we're, we're a different cloud because our tenants are, they don't necessarily know that they're on a cloud. They have a public network interface like you would expect in a shared or a dedicated hosting environment. Um, so they're directly attached to the public interface. We still isolate them kind of a unique requirement. Like they still need to be able to talk to each other, but they can't see each other's traffic. They can't know if they're on the same network. They need to feel like they're isolated. Uh, private networking is something that's coming down the line. So some of our components that we're using, uh, we use the no normal Nova components that, that everyone would expect. Oh, by the way, how many people have never even, like, I guess, how many of you are getting an intro to OpenStack right now? Okay, so, so some of you. So just some of these components, the Nova components are more related to hypervisor, and um, I guess more of the, more of the compute uh, type things. It does a lot of things, but it's more focused on hypervisors. Uh, Quantum is the networking abstraction. It's a, it's a new network abstraction. There's still not a ton of people using it. 
but we're using it because it supported uh, OBS and OpenFlow out of the box pretty well. Um, another thing that's a little different about our deployment is we're using Qubit for our messaging system, uh, which was maybe a bad choice in, in retrospect. And we're using MySQL for our uh, database backend. Does anybody have any questions about any of this? What would you have used instead of Qubit? Um, I'll talk about that more later, okay. but probably something that is a brokerless setup. What hypervisor are you using? We use uh, Lizard <coughs> with KVM. Okay. I was going to ask, uh, what, why did you use Qubit over what most people use with RabbitMQ? I'll, I'll also get into that, uh, right. so we'll get you there. Okay. Anybody else? So I want to briefly talk about kind of the scalability and stability issues that we had. Um, we also made some, some significant changes to the Open vSwitch plugin for Quantum. Uh, I also want to talk about our operational issues, uh, things that we've had to learn, all these lessons that we've uh, gone through and pain we've gone through. And then we'll have a, a short wrap up with some of our conclusions. So uh, another thing that we found out when we went to Portland, we kind of suspected this, but really OpenStack is, while it's designed to scale, uh, the limitations that are in there by the nature of how the software is written, you really don't give, get above a thousand nodes very easily. Uh, there are a couple components that just don't scale up, that probably have to be changed. For example, the messaging system, whether you're using Cupid or RabbitMQ, uh, very difficult to scale it up beyond certain points. Their model for scaling, um, what, what the AMQP people will tell you is that you need to start federating and routing messages around. And yeah, that, that sounds really nice, but it's really complicated to do at a software level. And OpenStack has no support <coughs> for that. Uh, I don't see that in its future. Well, at least in the near future. Uh, the database backend, I think most of us here are familiar with scaling issues there. We also have some very heavy APIs. Uh, when the uh, when a lot of the development happens, these people are thinking of hundreds of rows, thousands of rows, instead of millions, or, you know, people didn't believe me when I told them that we were allocating slash 19s and 18s. They're just like, what? You're lying. And, no, we're not. We really are. So, but there's no simulator, there's no emulation uh, to kind of plan out your scalability or to test it, like uh, there's in other cloud platforms like CloudStack. Uh, there's no guides on how to scale up. Really, the only people that are scaling up are Rackspace, um, us, HP, I, I don't know. I'm not aware of anybody beyond Rackspace and us that's really, really big. Uh, the error messages can be super cryptic. Uh, usually, you'll get a stack trace. So what this boils down to is if you want to run OpenStack, at this point, you need to understand the code very well. Like, you need to be able to read those stack traces. You need to understand what went on before that stack trace was even thrown. And that's getting better, but I think that's unfortunately still the reality of things. So as far as what we did to make things easier, we uh, really needed a service ping. We really needed to know when Nova Compute or Nova Volume or the APIs or whatever was down. <coughs> um, because of the way that Nova switches task states. So for example, if I go to create an instance, there are several stages to that. I need to make requests. Um, I need to then that request gets sent to a scheduler component, which is going to decide the good node to put it on, and that scheduler is going to cast it down to the compute node. Well, um, it's great and everything. When you go and create an instance via the API, I get a database row, and it says, "Okay, I, I've got a new instance. I've got a new ID. I've got all the information I need. I don't have a host name or anything like that." At that point, the API puts my instance into a scheduling state and uh, does what they call a cast which means throw it out there, kind of UDPS. Uh, we hope someone gets it. It uh, be kind of confusing for operators because let's say that scheduler is down. You know, that scheduling state uh, stays the same once it actually gets into the scheduler. So, I mean, even when the instance has been scheduled and sent off to the compute node, if it doesn't make it to the compute node, the task state is still scheduling. We have some more information. We have a host hypervisor and different things like that. But, so it's very confusing. Um, we tried to make that a little bit more discreet and add a few different task states so we could determine errors better. We also tried to uh, bubble up more verbose errors to, to the instance fault table. 
so that we can have our operators you know, look at things and intrinsically know, okay, this is what's wrong. Um, we use LVM for our back end for performance reasons. Uh, copy on write just wouldn't do it for us. So we added some functionality to do LVM resizing and injection of files. Um, obviously very important in a traditional hosting environment that we'd be able to stop a customer's box without just yanking the plug out. <coughs> we added that. That will probably make it into the next release of the stack. Um, also, we fixed a bunch of bugs. We basically started out playing with this for probably three months uh, on Essex. Folsom was released, and that day I had a 300 node cluster to deal with. And there were these features that we couldn't get in Essex. So really, that day we went, okay, we're going to use Folsom because it has all these nice things. Well, there were some bugs, so we got to eat some of that pain. Most of these have already been fixed in the main tree. Did a lot of that. Oh, and also, we had a problem scaling the scheduler. What we ended up doing eventually was just ripping out the scheduler completely and adding a scheduler that fit our application's requirements. Does anybody have any questions about any of this stuff? What if, I need to talk to you later about that scheduler. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry. So the scheduler is doing what? Where does it fit in the picture? The scheduler, uh, <coughs> it's an abstract piece. Basically, when you want to schedule, so you request a, an instance from the API. Uh, the default behavior of the scheduler is it either runs by filters, it uses certain criteria, it says, okay, you ask me for instance, this much RAM, this much CPU, this much disk, this is where I'm going to place you. For us, that doesn't even make sense. We know where we're going to put customers. So we just tell it, put it there. But even us telling it, put it there, we had scalability problems. So we really pared down. Um, I want to talk about our MySQL problems that we ran into. And really, this was all, uh, I want to give credit to Spencer on this because he did all the work on this. But so in the Folsom release, every Nova service has a direct connection to the database. Uh, this is addressed with Nova Conductor to some extent. But so that's kind of a problem. You have, like in our cluster, I was looking, <laughs> I was looking at our MySQL server and our max threads created as like 23,000. I'm like, oh, how does that even happen? But, so there are a lot of queries. Uh, OpenStack is very chatty. It, it's, uh, you know, sometimes it wants a, a little needle in the haystack, but it just gets the haystack. That happens quite a bit. We have lots of results returned. Uh, more reads than writes, but still super chatty. Um, we also have periodicity of loads. So uh, OpenStack has some behavior built into it to try and skew out. Um, periodic tasks and the, some of this behavior that would, uh, you know, that you just don't want to dump on, a, on an infrastructure all at once. And that seems to work to some extent, but still, we would see very periodic behavior regardless of that skewing. We would just kill our database and back off and kill our database and back off. And once we got above a, above a certain amount of nodes, that killing just never stopped. So what we found out you guys are all familiar with uh, the max connection setting in MySQL. So that basically uh, you can think of as a execution queue. <coughs> there are, let's say, a thousand guys waiting in line uh, ready to execute a query. Well, in the NODB engine, we then have thread concurrency. And that basically means the number of threads that can execute queries in the queue. Um, at least that's what I've translated it as. And by the way, once you get into the execution queue, you're handed some tickets. By default, this is 500. Okay, these tickets are basically redeemable for a single row or result. Um, when you have a query that's returning 5,000 results, what this basically means is it's going to go back out of the queue 10 times. When you're returning a large number of results, uh, this is just a death spiral. You'll <coughs> never get out of the queue. You'll never complete a single query. So. With default settings, your MySQL server is going to fall over somewhere between 1,000 and 3,000 nodes. Not because of hardware, but just because of the default settings for NODB. So just increase concurrency in tickets, right? Did you have somebody shaking his head here? <laughs> no. <laughs> so you do have to tune that. But for whatever reason, 
like maybe this is a bug, maybe this is something that we don't understand or it's undocumented, but we still see threads requeuing, even with an, you know, just an obscene amount of tickets, an obscene amount of thread concurrency. They go back in the queue, we still see the death spiral um, behavior. So our workaround is we, uh, I comb through the code base, so I try to find all of the read queries that I thought were safe to go against a slave, or if they just return a large amount of results, I went too bad, you're going to a slave, and wrote uh, kind of a DB slave handle, and sent a bunch of queries there. So now we have a write master, and then we have a bunch of read slaves. And so with that, we're able to scale, I feel like we'll be able to scale for, for quite a while. Uh, we haven't hit the edge of that. Spencer might not agree with me. <laughs> I feel like we'll be able to go pretty far with that. So here's the part where I talk about Cupid. You guys remember him? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we chose Cupid. Um, we were totally new to AMQP, to messaging systems. And so we went out there and started looking at technologies. And Cupid was. Um, you know, in benchmarks, it looked really good. Reading operations manuals, it looked like clustering would be a breeze. Um, in a lot of ways, it's just a lot less kludgy and less complicated than RabbitMQ, at least from outside here. So, so we, chose, we chose that, and what we found out is that we chose very poorly. It's very unstable. Um, at large scale, it's ridiculously unstable. Like, really, to keep it going, we need to be monitoring these services all the time. Anytime we want to pass a message, we have to make sure that it's up. We're restarting all the time. It's really bad. Even at a small scale, even in our beta environments, our 16 node clusters, our 8 node clusters, we see the same instability. So it's possible that we have not configured it well. I'm not just totally going to bash on Cupid and give them the benefit of the doubt. We're also using an older release that comes default in the CentOS uh, 6 release. But Really, when we look at it and we look at um, what we're using the messaging system for, we think that the broker being there is really the big problem. It's an unnecessary bottleneck. The features that it provides us aren't really, we don't, we don't care about. So we're really trying right now to rip out the broker um, and replace it with a brokerless implementation like ZeroMQ. Uh, are any of you guys familiar with ZeroMQ? For the ideas of AMQP and like how the broker works. Okay, cool. So anyway, that's uh, actually right when I left the office, uh, I had a guy putting zero MQ in our beta environment. We should be totally ZMQ, uh, zero MQ in our beta environment next week, and we'll try this out and see how it goes. You guys have any questions about this so far? How big is your beta environment? Uh, our beta environment is pretty small. It's a 16-node beta environment. Um, with some applications hitting it. So I, I don't know the full scope of it, but the hardware is basically 16 minutes. And uh, what's it, what are you using for image provision? Are you using Linux or doing something else? <coughs> so are you speaking about the hardware itself or the uh, VMs? Both is interesting. So we, uh, we got on the bandwagon before bare metal support was really fleshed out. So we ended up writing that on our own. It looks just like the Nova bare metal driver, basically. Um, so that's how we spin up our hardware, and then yeah, we use Glance in that even, and we also use Glance image of the units. Okay, so this is kind of our uh, a general overview of our final, our, our final, uh, I guess, uh, diagram of our whole uh, oh, thing, our environment. There we go. So we have a group of controllers here. We run services like Nova API, Nova Scheduler, Quantum Server, Keystone. Um, is there anything else there? That's pretty much it. And those guys are a load balanced uh, cluster of controllers. So anything that's a RESTful API that goes through a load balancer, goes through a <coughs> Some of you guys that are familiar with Quantum might go, oh, you guys are broken. Well, we're not. We do external locking to make sure that we don't have any race conditions there. Um, and we have this MySQL master, this is a very beefy machine, uh, as beefy as we could make it. That guy hopefully only writes go there. And then we have a bunch of read-only MySQL slaves that are also load balanced with a virtual IP. We have a cluster of Cupid servers. And uh, this, the, this cluster is not for capacity. In fact, adding more nodes to that Cupid cluster slows things down, reduces capacity <coughs> because of how they do their replication, which is basically the same thing for Rabbit, by the way. But uh, what it does allow us to do that if, if, if a Cupid server crashes, we're not losing service for everybody. We can hurry up and get it back up and 
but it's mostly an availability thing. Then we have our server farm here. These are our compute nodes. They're running uh, our enhanced OBS quant plugin and our enhanced version of no compute. So there's kind of an overview. You guys have any questions about this? How many rows do you have in your MySQL database? Um, I, I couldn't tell you. Order of magnitude even? Uh, <coughs> I, we're definitely in the millions. I, I would think. Not, not too far over that though. So, so you, you've been mentioning that uh, some of these services don't scale. Have you thought of, uh, about building uh, smaller uh, regions uh, inside your data center? And if so why didn't you go that route instead of going we, to Megazone? We thought about that, and we just like don't like the principle of it. And, um, and in what respect? The reason, okay, so so the the uh, the thing that you have to do that right now in OpenStack that really works well. You have zones um, that kind of makes you silo off into different control clusters, right? So instead of this guy, we have 10 of these, let's say, with their own controllers, maybe with their own database hosts, whatever. Um, so just that whole idea of segregating things out and then having an application above that that knows about them all, we just didn't like that idea. I would say there were, there were practical reasons as well. We wanted live migration on anything, including upgrading servers, but I didn't want to reboot stuff to upgrade it, or if it's hard to do a live migration anywhere on any piece of hardware, including for our clients. So, so, you, so yeah, okay, that makes a little bit more sense. Right. It also seems like, like your use case is a little bit different, because if, I'm, and forgive my ignorance, you're not also not exposing this externally to your users. This is all not abstractions. Yet. Yeah, yeah, this is, the users don't pay any of our APIs of, the, of no open stacks that you pass. Yeah. Um, the other reason was is in Folsom there were there was really no good way to do partitioning and siloing other than spinning up separate silos. Like now we have cells in Grizzly, and that's maybe something we'll look into more. But uh, personally, I mean, I think Spencer agrees with me. June agrees with me. This is OpenStack. It's supposed to be a homogenous cloud platform. It's supposed to be ubiquitous. You know, it really should deal with scale on its own. It should be elegant about it. It shouldn't make you silo. Uh, the structure accommodates that. Just some work that needs to be done in the code, in my opinion. Can you uh, go into what some of the enhancement or changes you made to Nova Computer? So I, I kind of talked about them. Mostly it has to do with LVM. Oh, okay. Um, some bug fixes, changing some behaviors. Uh, it, it, it's mostly just been tweaks here and there, like uh, things like uh, when we make swap space. We'd rather only do that, you know, once instead of every time a cluster is deployed. Just making that part of the image cache. When we do um, instance deletion, we'd rather not do the DD of zeros that thing right then. We'd rather delay it off. So we really didn't add a ton of functionality to Nova. The functionality we added to Nova is more related to networking, and, and June will get into that quite a bit. Any more questions? All right, I'm going to turn the time over to June. Um, yeah. So um, before I actually joining, you know, you know close to last year, um, I was involved in other type of actually cloud platform uh, development, actually using cloud stack. So there were, you know, there are several actually the other choices right now, uh, and then. I, I, I kind of it's been lucky to you know expose myself to those uh, different type of you know cloud platform. Um, cloud stack compared to actually open stack is a kind of a really mature uh, in the production quality there with some limitation. Uh, open stack uh, it, I think is more open to real whatever the available actually technology and structurally in many ways is better, but. Unfortunately, it's not mature enough for live production. Um, as as Mike just uh, you know illustrate all this issue, we ran into uh, basically like a lot of scalability and then instability issue. Um, uh, we struggled a lot actually. Uh, so while we struggled you know, with those problem, um, one of one of another critical component we have to address is actually network abstraction layer. Uh, Cloud Stack actually has really good abstraction layer for live you know really for live production quality. Versus, uh, you know, OpenStack didn't have. Uh, they barely started to provide new concepts like quantum. 
and then uh, we chose this one like uh, oh because anyway it's, it's better than previous variable the most no but you know no but that you know kind of component but unfortunately we found also uh, this model itself is not enough for our live production at all and then there is some critical design issue um, so main main problem is that actually it, it, the design is not really API around um, so just uh, apparently it seems like there is an API but internally only just the limited you know data beside them and then uh, still no compute to do the rest of some things uh, that is kind of messing uh, all the things uh, internal workflow so our approach was basically um, you know, we 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 thought that actually the open B switch um, quantum plugin is going to be probably powerful tool to us. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the open B switch shortly. Okay. Um, so what we decided is okay, let's add more intelligence into the existing OBS plugin, uh, and then also sometimes we need to optimize API. Uh, some you know API is horribly heavy. <coughs> um, even though we found that design issue here, but we didn't have enough time, so we just accepted the, that the bogus design, but we just focusing on the adding necessary feature we needed to actually have. So let me have just a, a little bit introduction about the Open B switch. Um, basically, this uh, support uh, Open Flow right now. Open Flow version 1.0. Um, there are more advanced uh, specification already done. Um, and that there are experiment stages, and then I've seen recently some of switch uh, providing even higher version of open flow, like HP switch or some of the switch recently. Mainly designed for supporting the various type of hypervisor, including KVM. Um, it it has been merged officially into mainstream uh, since the new 3.3 as a replacement of the you know EV table, IP table or Linux bridge. So it's, you know, uh, it, it, it is kind of a you know, superset of those are actually modules. So basically, it is, cons it is consistent of two components, uh, filtering rules and associated you know, actions. So we can do a lot of stuff. Uh, we can do anti-IP spoofing, and then we can do destination address filtering, uh, layer two or layer three, any layer we can just do. Uh, it has its own, its own the QS system, or we may just use uh, external like uh, existing the you know, TC traffic control. Um, there are a bunch of actually you know open flow basically. Uh, is the people think is going to be future? Uh, well, I don't know, but uh, it is it is very important component for uh, soft, software design the net, defined network SDN. So a lot of people, network vendor, uh, try to utilize this uh, direction. So a lot of actually third party controller, open flow controller already there that has a full fledged actually functionality. Uh, but for us, we thought that, oh, we may need a, such a uh, centralized actually, controller. Somehow we can <coughs> you know, maybe able to utilize the existing open stack uh, structure uh, by adding more intelligence so using actually the you know, OBS. So that's uh, our actually approach. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about the actual, the current you know, internal workflow between the Nova Compute um, and Quantum Agent. So when there is an API call to create a new instance, and Nova Compute to get it, and then uh, try to create port, and then by calling Quantum API to Quantum Server. And Quantum Server actually created a port in database only. And they say, oh, you, you have port. Is a whole fake port. Now, traditionally, what happened is basically, you know, before introducing quantum uh, concept, OpenStack, you know, Nova Computer had had everything in it, including network abstraction. That's why, even though they just try to pull out the network abstraction, still some of you know functionality is remaining. That caused a lot of problem and confusion right now. So, what? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little slow with uh, quantum and open flow. What, what do you mean exactly by creating a port? Um, it's, at, at this point, it's just an abstraction. It's like a row in the database. A port would be representative of a network device. So a okay. interface. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Heavy interface. Got it. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. So in order to actually create a you know, instance, we need to prepare whatever the you know, tab interface. 
they can fed into the end, right? <coughs> that heavy interface they have to activate as like a port in OpenStack. So okay. they just try to create a port. And then you know, Nova Computer actually himself uh, needed to create a open, open VCH actually heavy interface rather than other network abstraction layer create. But that's the kind of very first prob problem behavior, problematic behavior. Uh, and then set up some you know, external ID on that interface. So external ID means here kind of metadata information, uh, which instance uh, owns this uh, tab interface, and which network ID uh, of that uh, port, something like that. But it's kind of partial information only. Now then, um, you know, Nova computers do the rest of things, uh, assuming that I really got port, but it's all fake because you know, we have not really deployed necessary open flow, you know, you know, flows at all. That's why, you know, BM at this point doesn't have a real network connectivity yet. Until quantum agent, okay, you look through, the external ID changing. If somebody changes, in this case, you know, what compute, change the external ID, then okay, I, I got something that needed to be done. So call again API because uh, it's partial information only. I need to get full information and call again redundantly or unnecessarily. And then uh, you know, modify you know, the external ID as it is and then finally you know, deploy the OBS flow and then real flow you know, happening. So this uh, pattern is completely implicit communication. That's the bogus pattern. And uh, thankfully, anyway, you know, OpenStack submit. Uh, I think they recognize our comments, um, so they they change the actual direction for the rest of actually Grizzly. Really, no, no, no. Uh, what is it? Yeah. Havana. Yeah, Havana. So um, I think uh, hopefully, you know, they can you know get done better. Um, okay, so here is our uh, Blue Stinest OBS content plugin. Uh, we have a very unique kind of a requirement. Uh, right now, actually, we focus on one job, but definitely we need to, you know, address multiple data center issues later. Um, the one unique requirement is basically we have to provide direct public interface to VM without using any native technology. The thing is that the current OpenStack somehow like enforce the you, you know, customer use only their native. Uh, for dealing with uh, actually public IP address. So that's one problem actually initially. Uh, the, the other thing is that even though we would like to directly provide public IP address to the VM, but they sh sh shouldn't, shouldn't see each other. Uh, only is allowed actually when they really talk to other VM through public IP address, then we have to allow them. So it's kind of appeared to be conflict requirement initially. And our approach is that, okay, um, why not just utilize the existing OBS plugin that is already fully disputed? Because the uh, OBS plugin <coughs> agent are already running on every computer node. So we thought of like a developed, uh, developing also the concept of a disputed open flow controller uh, rather than using a third party controller right now. Um, the, one of the important strategy in terms of finding the better solution for us is um, finding any solution that does not use any VLAN tag. Because as you know that VLAN, once we start to use VLAN tag and then we're going to just tie to that the limitation of 4K. So since we already have like a 16,000 physical number more than that, and we cannot even start right now. Already we just uh, exceed that number. So we just try to find any solution that does not use any VLAN tag. If, if, we, if we can find it, we can just use it, that's all. But some cases, we may not be able to find uh, without using any tag concept. Then jump to that uh, other type of protocol that has at least a 24-bit ID, rather than 12-bit as in VLAN. So like a lot of protocol uh, existing already, QNQ and VXLAN, GRE, all those actually protocol already has a 24 bit, which means that um, 16 millions. So it's, it's going to be enough uh, at least uh, for several years. <laughs> okay. Something like MPLS work better in that situation, or well, maybe labels yeah, return? Or? Yeah, that's one thing, but you know, we still try to find. We, you know, we haven't gone down that road yeah, really. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> um, 
caveat though here, <coughs> as I said, uh, we just uh, accept the existing bogus design. Uh, so still no API around design. Um, and we don't use any kind of fancy concept of virtual appliance as in Cloud Stack. Um, Cloud Stack has a, you know, utilized this kind of virtual appliance concept. <coughs> Basically, just to spin up the only the very dedicated VM that handle all this uh, network abstraction layer, including netting or firewall, uh, load balancing, and everything. But OpenStack, I don't know. I think um, they probably started to utilize this kind of approach. Um, and then uh, while we, you know, working on this obvious stuff, uh, because we manipulating, you know, very, you know, low level, you know, network, you know, devices. Uh, there is possible potential that talks to is very hard to track down sometimes. But then anyway, maybe just find <laughs> them. So these are the all new features we added. Uh, Anti-IP thing and then multiply this per core, um, QoS, um, optimal intra-traffic uh, flows among VMs. So I'm gonna give the actual detailed level of algorithm uh, we've done using OBS you know, flows. Uh, by the way, we already actually shared all this source code uh, with the community. Uh, we, we probably continue to do that. Um, even though we couldn't fo follow that their official process to contribute, we just had you know, our, own, our own stuff, but uh, we're starting to actually you know, officially follow their actually, you know, path. Anyway, this is uh, kind of originally given uh, implementation of, of you know, quantum plugin. So they utilize actually tag, as you can see. Like they assign different tag for different VMs. That way they can differentiate, you know, differentiate the network. Uh, they create actually a uh, you know, pair of these uh, virtual interfaces. It's kind of a you know, tunneling pipe. If we, if we, if we, yeah, it's kind of patch port in GRE. Like if we inject packet and then automatically you know, pass to this guy. Uh, and then this is a physical interface to that. And then this left size integration bridge where um, the VM step will be connected to. Um, <clears throat> now from here, as, as we said, you know, okay, we don't want to use any tag mechanism. Uh, that's first thing. And then by the way, there is a bug. So you know, it turns out to you nobody used this plugin in the world because we did that bug, you know, but we, 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 we couldn't hear any complaint about that bug. It's not for all. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so from here uh, is our, our approach. So get rid of all the tag. Uh, we just deploy the obvious flow that understand the targeted MAC address for the VM. Because this, this each, each quantum plugin already know that what is the associated MAC address for each, each VM. So deploy the nicely of you know, the matching actually the obvious flow for incoming packet. And for outgoing packet, um, we can also deploy the QS. Like, okay, you have just 10 Mac, the other guy has 50 Mac, something like that. Uh, we don't have, you know, the, you know this uh, different differentiation level yet, but uh, we, we, we would like to implement uh, further. But right now, it's global, it's kind of fixed. So, like a 10 Mac. Or, uh, uh, then, we also deploy on, the, on this side, like an entire IP screen. So, we look at the IP address, source IP address. If, if useful, okay, we're not going to allow to pass that, we just drop it. Um, so the this one, the let's say VM VM one uh, try to talk to VM two through public IP address. Then uh, we need to report back the packet to inside the you know, host again. So we newly introduced the concept of a loopback port here. Uh, so another pair of actually virtual interface. So when there is a packet. Uh, coming out from VM1 and then look at the target MAC address. Okay, I know this MAC address is supposed to be VM2. So we report back through that uh, new actually path and then just send you out to the VM. So this is a uh, basic uh, structure of uh, our, uh, you know, the OBS plugin. Um, <coughs> Now I'm going to talk about uh, you know some of the uh, operational issues uh, we ran into. Um, the, the, by the way, do you have any question about this diagram or anything? I think okay. Uh, the, some some comment we got though feedback actually. It turns out to be the you know not only us some yeah some some people actually wants to have this kind of feature 
they want to really directly provide uh, that interface. So they were really happy to see, you know, our approach. Oh yeah, that's the one thing we really would like to deploy. So. Um, the very interesting, let's say, when we reboot the one node, the expectation is that, yeah, automatically we start all the pre-existing DM, right? <laughs> never, <laughs> never done that way. Uh, because the, there is a very interesting, there is a circular dependency between some important component in OpenStack. In order to run Nova Compute, we have to run report D. In order to run report D, we have to run Nova Compute. So simple solution. Just restart them several times more. <laughs> 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 anyway, that's a very uh, structural problem. So we didn't really pay attention. Okay, okay. We, we have watch out the other critical problems, so we just focus on that right now. So restart the service also. Sometimes uh, we don't want to smashing out the existing working tab interface at all. But sometimes uh, unnecessarily just. Uh, clean up all the tab and recreating and so causing a lot of you know network hiccup. So we just uh, you know you know had our patches to fix that. Um, and the monitor has a lot of scalability issue, instability issue. We had to have our own some health checking API. Um, the the last item I would like to share is that actually it's kind of horrible um, problem. Right now, there's no way to customize XML in OpenStack because the XML, the formatting is tied to you know every single line of the source code. In order to change any one item, I have to update the source code accordingly. Otherwise, there is no way to do that. So anyway, some of our customer wants to have a very different type of customization, so we had to apply our own patches. Okay, so here's the wrap up. So this is a full matrix uh, summarize uh, what we've done in terms of uh, stability you know, issue, uh, scalability issue, and network side uh, abstraction, uh, and as well as operational. Uh, some of them I think is a uh, good go with, it, but some of them still uh, it's just a tentative solution. We continue to actually work on to find any better solution. Yeah. So as a conclusion, we found that actually to, in order to make OpenStack really succeed uh, for the cloud platform as a real, you know, real true open source uh, you know, project, the first item, as Mike actually already illustrated, the scalability. This is really, really critical uh, issue uh, that needed to be addressed. Uh, so that's one thing, and then underlying, as you, as you found that we have to have somehow anyway scale, truly scalable messaging system. Otherwise, uh, um, you know, all the problem actually will be there. Um, network side, uh, you know, OpenStack should have uh, you know, production quality. So here's some uh, you know GitHub. Uh, you can probably, if you're interested, in look at actually the actual source code. There are some source code there. Any any questions? I think he was first. So if I set my MAC address to an internal computer's MAC address, one of you guys' virtual machine's MAC addresses, would it accidentally get routed to the loopback address, or would it be smart enough to actually? It's protected by KVM. KVM itself. Um, we're you restart the services of Ripper and Nova Compute when you reboot a node. Uh, is that something that you've set up to be automatically so that when the node reboots, it just automatically restarts those services like five times each or something? <laughs> if or you consider RC local automatic, yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that's automatic enough. Is, is there a fixed limit on how many times you try to restart, or do you just restart until it doesn't come down? It, it's again? not. It's not like we do exaggerate. No, no, we no. We restart no. once. Like oh, okay. <laughs> just once. Okay. That's that's a fixable problem. It's just something that we never got back to. It's really easy. What's the dependency that Libvirt has on Nova Compute? Yeah, the tab interface. You go see here. In order to really successfully start a VM, there must be tab, which is pre-existing. 
right? If yes. that type interface doesn't exist yet, then you cannot start, right? But who is creating type interface? Nova Compute. But in order to run Nova Compute, Nova Compute first checking the report daemon is running. Oh, it's not running. I'm not going to start. Hmm. You know like that. Any other questions? So it sounds like you've massively changed Folsom. I wouldn't say massively. <laughs> Some areas, yes. Very different. So are you looking at going to Grizzly, or does it have anything promise for you? We'll see. I would, we'll probably, we'll, we'll, we'll make an intermediate step, I'm guessing, before we go to Havana. Yeah, Spencer's going to argue with me there. <laughs> I think we'll make an intermediate step, but like Grizzly doesn't provide a ton of new features for us that we want. Havana's going to provide a ton that we're going to want. Probably re So you're pushing things upstream as you go, I guess? We, we finally are pushing more things upstream. We got like one patch into, full, into Grizzly. Uh, we're doing a couple, a couple of pieces. We'd like to do more, but really the guys that are developing are me and June, and the guys that are running things are, are me and June. I mean, that's not, that's not completely true. We have a whole staff of operators and everything, but really when things are broken, we got to fix it. So it's hard to contribute right now. Uh, with OpenStack, I haven't really looked into it too much. Um, does it offer the ability to provide your customers with things like their own virtualized router instances or switches, switch instances or uh, security de device type situations that are hosted in software where they can use? That, that isn't really available right now. There's, there's some of that in the old, uh, I guess it's not quite deprecated yet, but in the Nova network model, there's support for security groups, um, there's support for VPNs. Uh, it's kind of very specific support, but uh, for the Havana release, you should have all that. They're pursuing that pretty aggressively. How, what, how well did the upgrade from Essex to Folsom go for you? <laughs> it went really well. <laughs> we, we, uh, yeah, we had a small number of nodes, like seriously, like a couple hundred when we went from Essex to Folsom. So it wasn't that big of a deal. But I mean, at the time, there was no official way to upgrade the from like those up there. Yeah, it's it's kind of convoluted. Yeah. We could talk about it more later if you want, because okay. it, it's really a complicated to talk about. Yeah. Any other questions? <coughs> so with uh, I've only played with Stack on 10 to 20 mil. Uh, what, what kind of problems are you looking to solve by switching from um, you know uh, Q to like uh, zero Q? Basically the broker as a bottleneck. So um, OpenStack's messaging communication, you basically have, so, so really they use AMQP for notifications and for RPC. Where it's used for RPC is our biggest problem. Uh, there are two different versions of RPC. There's a cast, which is kind of the UDPS, throw it out there, hopefully somebody got it. And there's a call, which requires a response over the message bus. Um, so what happens is uh, AMQP internally, when you do a cast, the broker comes back and acknowledges. It says, yeah, I got that, we're good. And that's kind of why we have the assumption built into the code that, oh, it just works. Um, what happens on the compute node end is it has a subscription to a routing key. Uh, they call them topics. Uh, so let, let's say it's, it's listening on the basketball routing key. For whatever reason, we have a bug where uh, a listener will lose its subscription to a routing key. So the broker says, yep, I got that. I delivered it to, let's see who's listening to that route. No one. Ack. Ah, good. So without a broker, what we will see is a direct failure, um, which is, I think, a lot better. And also, we just don't have to have that step of going to broker. We don't, we don't really need that. We don't need persistence of messages. If that message is going to go through, we want it to go through. If it's going to fail, we would like to know that it failed right then. So how many RPC requests do you see going through your broker per second or whatever? Um, I, I wish I had those metrics. I could only make a guess, really. Like, I bet we're somewhere in the hundreds of requests per second, and probably under 300 or so. Somewhere around there. That, that, okay. I don't have a lot of data to support that. That's just my guess. 
Uh, quick question. Uh, how are you load balancing your controllers? Because you've obviously got a model of one bigger dome. Um, so more of the hardware side of things, um, obviously you've got multiple inputs to that. Are you network massaging that to load balance it? Are you running multiple IPs or one multicast? Or? So we have a single FIP. Okay. Virtual IP, it's, it's actually, actually we're using open, or not open BSD, <coughs> heaven forbid, a uh, free BSD. Oh, on, Sorry, I, anybody that's a BSD fan. But. So a free BSD has uh, a little package called RelayD. Okay. Um, RelayD works pretty good because it has CARP integrated. Unlike, yeah. unlike Linux CARP, yeah. um, it, it really does do true VRP, true failover. Okay. So that's what we use. It's super simple. It's just round robin. So everything gets routed to the VIP, and then from the VIP, uh, we do DSR load balancing. Are you guys familiar with DSR? DSR is direct server return. Basically, we don't do any adding or anything like that. It's max substitution. So the SYN goes to load balancer. The rest of the session goes directly to the node, sticks to it until the TCP session is done. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.